So today we will start, now that we have the fundamental tools, we've defined formally the notion of probability measure, I will explain how we will apply this language and this formalism and these techniques in the study of dynamical systems. So if you remember, a dynamical system is a map on a space. So it would be useful for us to think of X in general as a compact matrix space. which means that the X naturally has a topology given by the metric and a Borel sigma algebra, which is the basis on which we will construct measures for this space. Then we have a map, which generally will be at least continuous, but not always. And if you remember, one of the key definitions, one of the key ways that we use to study the dynamics of this map from a topological point of view is the omega limit set of a point. Remember? So we define the omega limit set of a point is equal to the set of y in x such that f and i of x converges to y for some subsequence. So we have our space x, our point x, and the orbit of x. In our space, and what this captures is somehow the asymptotic behavior of the point. Right? If x is a fixed or periodic point, then the omega limit set is just the orbit itself. Is just the orbit itself. If not, it says what the orbit converges to. And of course, the orbit may converge to some fixed point, but it may also not converge to anything and be dense in the space, in which case the omega limit set is the whole space. Okay. So now we want to address a question of the frequency of the distribution of this orbit in space. So this does not tell you where the orbit spends most of the time. So the orbit could be dense, but it could be that if you just look at the orbit, it spends lots of time in here, and then it spends a few iterates around here, and then lots of time here, and then a few orbits around here. There is a kind of time distribution of the orbit, which is a more detailed description of the dynamics. And we will use the language of probability theory to describe this. In some sense, we're saying, what is the probability? If you wait some number of iterates and you just pick, you, you look at some random time, what is the probability that this orbit is here or here or here or in this region of space? Okay, so I will explain how to formalize this idea. So first of all, let us define a kind of probabilistic omega limit set. And the objects of this set will be measures so mu in M, remember M is the space, so M equals the set of all Borel probability measures. And here this probabilistic omega limit set is a set of measures such that this average converges to mu for some n i uh, wait so I need to use j here for some n j tending to infinity so what is this object here remember what this is This is the Dirac delta measure on the point fi of x. This is a probability measure. Okay? This is the sum of these probability measures, and this is the average, in some sense, of these probability measures. So 
What does this mean? This means that you look at the Dirac delta on the point x, you look at the Dirac delta on the point f of x, f2 of x, f3 of x, okay? For example, let's just write an example here. So for example, i equals 0 to 2, for example, of Dirac delta fi of x. This is just, sorry, 1 over um, 3. This is just 1 over 3 of the Dirac delta in x plus the Dirac delta in f of x plus the Dirac delta in f2 of x. So what is this measure? This is a measure, right? What is the measure of a set? For example, what is the measure of this set with respect to this measure? One third, exactly, right? Or if you take a set that contains two, it will be two over three. If you take a set that contains all three, it will be one. It's a probability measure because the maximum total measure of the whole space is just the sum of these measures, if you take the whole space, then you, you, take, you, measure, you measure the whole space with this set, then this will give measure 1 to the whole space, this will give measure 1, this will give measure 1, these three will give measure 3, you divide by 3, you get measure 1. So this is a simple way, remember this is a linear combination of Dirac measures on orbits, I mentioned those the other time, okay? Um, in this case, the specific points that you choose are points along the orbit. So that's how we start to introduce some dynamics into these measures. When you take n large, right, if you take a large number, then you are taking many, many of these Dirac delta measures, and you're taking the average. And so this measure will start to be concentrated on the region in which there are lots of points of the orbit. So for example, if this point is spending a lot of time here, then this measure here will give a lot of weight to that region. And I will give some examples now. Okay? And so as you tend to infinity, the question is, does this probability measure, always remember, this is a probability measure. It is the sum of measures, but you average, so it's a probability measure. Does it converge to a particular probability measure, and we will discuss what this convergence means from a dynamical point of view, okay? But this is the definition. So first of all, this convergence is intended in the weak star topology that I defined the other day. So let me remind you what this means. So in the weak star topology, what this means um, is that the integral So convergence is intended in the weak star topology. So So what we have is that, um, wait, let me write it. Yeah. So remember that the weak star topology says that the integral of phi with respect to this measure Converges to the integral of phi d mu for all phi continuous. This is the definition of convergence in the weak star topology. And so, just to put it in a form that is a little bit more, a uh, little bit less formal, notice that what this means, you're integrating this function with respect to this measure, right? If you remember, because this is a discrete measure, this is a measure that lives just on a set of points, 
right? So remember when you integrate, we did the example last time, when you integrate a function with respect to a measure that lives on a single point, that integral is just the value of that function in that point, right? So here you can just pull out the sum. So here you can just write 1 over nj times the sum i equals 0 to nj minus 1 of the integral of phi d delta fi of x. And this is just the integral in this point. So this is just the value of phi. So this is just the integral, okay, integral of phi. Uh, so, sorry, I don't want the integral here. This is just equal to 1 over nj, the sum i equals 0 to nj minus 1 of phi composed with fi of x. So this will be very useful. So I'm just rewriting this convergence. So this says that this converges to phi d mu for all phi continuous. So this is the way that actually we will work with this notion because this is something that can be checked in various situations. But this is exactly equivalent to this, okay? So the convergence in this sense means exactly that the delta Dirac, the average of the delta Dirac converges in the weak star topology. So let's look at some examples of this probabilistic omega limit set. So, uh, obvious example, suppose P is an attracting fixed point, okay, so we have our space X, we have a point P, and then for any initial condition X0, it just converges to P, right, Fn of it, well, initial condition f converges to p as n tends to infinity for all x in x. Or even if you just take a single orbit that converges to p. Then what are the measures that are in the probabilistic omega limit set? the point x. Dirac delta in P. Right? So this is exactly equal to the Dirac delta in P. And you can easily check that because if you look at the orbit, okay, from this condition, you immediately look, you look at you take a continuous function, okay, and you evaluate the continuous function along the points of the orbit, and you take the average of these values, right? And what this orbit is doing is converging to the point P, right? So after a long, long amount of time, in a very small epsilon neighborhood of P, there will be many, many points of the orbit, and the points that stay outside this neighborhood will be just some small finite number, and therefore the value of phi in this neighborhood of p will be very, very close to the value of phi in p itself because phi is continuous, right? And so because you're taking the average and most points will be close to the point p, this value will be very close to phi of p um, in most points. And that's what the integral, if our limit measure mu is the Dirac delta in p, then this is exactly phi of p here, right? So if you want me to write this down, Indeed, um, uh, well, I'll just write 1 over n 
integral i equals 0 to n minus 1 of phi composed with fi of x clearly converges to phi of p, which is exactly equal to the integral of phi. because phi is continuous and because fn of x is converging to p. So this is a simple, fairly simple situation. Yes? Yes, probabilistic omega limit. Excuse me? No, it is not necessarily the case that it's not empty. This will be one of the first questions we will ask. Yes. So, as you remember, also in the topological omega limit, one of the first propositions we proved was that in certain cases, if the space is compact, if the map is continuous, then it's non empty. And in this case, we will discuss the conditions that guarantee that it's non empty and lots of properties. This whole course, in some sense, will be devoted to studying in the various situations what is the property of this set. Yeah, so that's a good question. So in fact, this is a good question also because what we will be very interested in is if it's non-empty and if it contains a single measure or if it contains many measures, okay? And I will discuss, uh, so this is where it starts, the, the notion starts diverging from the topological notion, okay? Now I will discuss an example in which you might have several measures. And I will also discuss that when you have several measures, it's kind of a problem. It's not a nice situation. So in fact, what we're looking for, what we will be looking for in the course, is situations in which the omega, probabilistic omega limit set has a single measure. And I will explain why with the following example. So let's take the opposite extreme. As you know, remember, from a topological point of view, we kind of had on one extreme contractions in which you have this kind of behavior, and on the other extreme expansions. For example, if we have x 0, 1 to 0, 1, and then f 0, 1 to 0, 1, given, for example, by x goes to 2x mod 1, expanding map that we've studied in some detail. And if you remember, this map has this graph, looks like this, 0, 1, 1 half. And the graph looks like this. And we did a fairly detailed study of the topological structure of these maps. And if you remember, we had two, um, we had a symbolic coding for these maps, I0 and I1. And we showed that if you take a point X and you iterate it, and you can associate to this point x a infinite sequence of zeros and ones depending on its orbit in i0 and i1. Right? And most importantly, we showed that basically any possible sequence of zeros and ones, there is a point that has that sequence as its sequence. Okay? So, in particular, we showed that there's dense orbits. Right? So there exists x such that omega x uh, is equal to the whole of the interval 0, 1. Remember that? What was the kind of symbolic structure of such points? Do you remember? How did you? They had all combinatorics. What do you mean by all combinatorics? So if you look at the sequence, so let a bar be the associated sequence, then um, um, A bar contains all possible 
finite blocks of zeros and ones. That was the feature that guaranteed that the orbit was dense. Okay, then orbit of x is dense in zero one. So as well as dense orbits, there were periodic orbits in here, right? There was many different structural orbits. Um, so now that we have this new way of looking at it, we want the probabilistic description of this orbit. So we want to know where this orbit spends most of this time. Suppose that AX has a dense orbit. What can we say about where it spends most of its time? So, suppose omega x is equal to zero one. Okay. What about probabilistic limit set of x? Hmm? Would it be? So what is, your, what is your remark? Your remark is that for every, say again, for every point in 0, 1, so you're saying that for all y in 0, 1, delta Dirac in y, ah, OK, is this true? F, you can, uh, F is not continuous, but it uh, might as well be continuous. You know, if you think of, you can, you can actually define this function on the, on the circle, unit circle S1, and then it becomes continuous on the circle. It's just a different way of looking. So uh, this is, is, in this particular case, this does not play a big role. But this is a good starting point. So what is... What would it mean if each Dirac delta is in the probability measure? What does this mean? We're trying to develop an intuition and a way of understanding and thinking about this limit. You see, um, this is true in some sense, in the topological sense. So the fact that omega limit is 0, 1 means that the orbit of this point comes arbitrarily close to every point. Okay? But is this what the probabilistic omega limit said? In other words, is that where it's spending time? Where is it spending time? Where is it spending most time? Is it spending most of the time? Is it Spending, spending about the same amount of time everywhere? Or is the orbit concentrated and spending more time in some places and less time in other places? Uh, I think it's uh, distributed normally. It's distributed it's uniformly. Consistent. Why? Because any, for, for any point we can view plus minus Can we? Okay, so remember that mu is in the omega probability, probabilistic omega limits of, sec, of x if 1 over nj sum of i equals 0 to nj minus 1 phi composed with fi of x converges 
to the integral of phi d mu, okay, for some sequence nj tending to infinity. So what does this mean? What does this what what is this telling us? So what what is this? This is the key, right? I mean this we understand what it is. So uh, first of all we understand I mean, remember I emphasized last time what what is this integral of phi? What this is is somehow telling you so it's an inter, it's an interplay between phi and d mu, right? Because this integral is a number Okay, that depends both on the function and on the measure. It depends on the function because this is a function. So remember, uh, so this is also for all phi 0, 1 to r continuous. So phi is a continuous function. 0, 1 is some continuous function. And if you just took the usual Riemann integral, you would just be looking at the area under the graph. Okay. Here you're also looking at the end of uh, the, gra the graph, but with respect to this measure. So if this measure is, for example, the Dirac delta at a point, then this is just the value of phi at that point. If this measure is more well distributed, if it's Lebesgue measure, if this measure is Lebesgue measure, then it is really the same as the Riemann integral. Okay, it's the area under the graph. So this value here depends on the function and on the measure. You need this convergence for any function, right? So that's why this is saying something about the convergence of measures to this measure. So what would it mean to say that it is, um, that this, that if you put here delta y, then this is converging to the integral of delta y. This would be mean that this is converging for some subsequence to the value of phi in y, right? So you say y, you look at the Dirac delta on this point y, and you want to know is this sequence along the orbit of x, is this average value of phi converging to phi of delta y? This is the question. Is it converging to phi of delta no, one? <laughs> so the best way is to give an example, okay, and, and see what happens. So let me cons let me uh, if you remember we made this observation that once you have an infinite sequence that contains all possible finite blocks, it does not have to contain only these possible finite blocks. You can always, in between any blocks, you can add any number of sequences that you want, any number of digits, and it will still be dense because it still contains all finite blocks. Okay? So let me take... So let... A um, be the sequence associated to X, okay? And now let me do something. Let me start putting in some large blocks of zeros into this sequence, okay? Let us, let us uh, construct a new sequence a hat which uh, by adding many long finite blocks of zeros So for example, my initial sequence is this, a0, a1, a2, a3, a4, and so on, and contains all finite blocks. So now here, I add 
zero 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 Here I add zero 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 zero. And then as I keep going, a n, a n plus one, okay, here I add one million zeros. So this new sequence, and I keep doing this every so often, I can even after every finite block, I can add a million zeros. 10 million zeros, more and more million zeros, how many I want, okay? So this sequence that I construct will correspond to some point. I don't know which point, it will correspond to some point here. Well, I can assume that my original point is constructed like this. So this is now, this is the sequence of my point X that I'm considering. So what is the, where is this point spending a lot of time? So suppose I iterate, I iterate, right? Every time I iterate, I shift the sequence to the left, okay? So I iterate a few times, and then when I iterate three times, the sequence of the third iterate will start with many zeros. So what does that mean about where this point is? You remember? It's quite close to zero, right? Because if you remember when we did the structure, we did the partition, if you start with a lot of zeros, it means you're very close to zero because you stay in I0 for a long time, okay? And it will stay in I0 for a long time, as you can see. So when you iterate, you will have still a lot of zeros, and then slowly the number of zeros is reducing, and then at some point it will jump to whatever. This may be a zero or a one or whatever, and then it may jump away, okay? But then a few more iterates, and then suddenly the new sequence starts with 20 zeros. So it is even closer to zero. Not only that, but it spends about 20 iterates very close to zero. And then I jump to the other sequence, and then after however many I want, after only even just after one more finite block, I can put a million zeros, which means it spends, it comes very close to zero, and it spends one million iterates near zero. So I can organize this so that the proportion of time that it spends near zero is getting larger and larger because I can, I can put, for example, if this n is 1,000, I can follow this by a million zeros. And then after the next block, after the, some finite number of iterates, I can put 100 million zeros if I want. So I can make sure that the proportion of zeros is much, much bigger than the proportion of time up to time n that he has spent outside this region. So even though the orbit is dense, I can make sure that the, the time that is spending in different regions is converging to zero because the longer you wait and the more a greater proportion of that time it is spending in a very small neighborhood of zero. I am choosing the point very specifically, okay? I'm not saying this is the general behavior. I'm saying there exists a point whose orbit is dense, but it has so many zeros and so many big blocks of zero that when you look at the time averages here, okay, the amount of time, what you're doing here is you're taking the average value of phi along this orbit. But this orbit is spending 90, 99% of the time, 99% of the time in a very, very small neighborhood of zero. And so the average value of phi will be very close to the value of phi at zero, phi of zero. And therefore this, the longer you wait, and this is actually converging to phi of zero, which is the integral of phi with respect to the Dirac delta at zero. Okay, so if I add 
enough zeros, I can construct, if you want, or choose, I can construct a point for which the omega limit set of x is equal to the whole interval. Okay. But the probabilistic limit set is just equal to the Dirac delta at zero. Proving this is very easy. I will leave it as an exercise. <laughs> Look, it's very easy. All you need to show is that this is converging. So let me leave it as an exercise. Okay. What is difficult is coming to terms with the with the idea, with the fact, okay? The proof is actually very easy because all you need to prove is that this is converging to phi of zero because phi of zero is exactly the integral of phi with respect to the Dirac delta. So if this converges for every sequence, okay, you don't even need to take a subsequence. How do you arrange for this to converge for every sequence to phi of zero? Okay, it's easy. This is taking the average value of phi along the orbit. So as long as the orbit is spending more and more time in an arbitrarily small neighborhood of zero, then this is converging to phi of zero. Okay, so if you want to prove it formally, you'd have to say take epsilon, take an epsilon neighborhood of zero and show that this average after some long enough amount of time is closer than epsilon to phi of zero. Okay, and to show this, you just need to use the fact that you have introduced many more zeros than there have been iterations, right? So after uh, one million symbols, in other words, one million iterations, 99% of those are zero. And then after one billion iterations, you want to make sure that 99.9% .9 of those are zeros of the symbols. So you look at the first, you know, you look at the first n symbols and you want one minus epsilon proportion of those symbols to be zero. And then you know that it will have spent a very large proportion near zero. So this fact depends on the fact that you have constructed the sequence in a specific way. So I emphasize that, okay? I have designed the sequence with this property. I have not just... But because I know that I'm free to design a sequence however I want, because I've already shown, we showed in the previous course, that for any sequence you choose, there exists a point that has that sequence. So it's okay. I can just work on the symbolic level. Okay? So I think because this might need a couple of minutes to digest, let's take a couple of minutes break now, okay? And then we'll come back. Okay, so how is this connected to the notion of the probability of where the point is at a given moment? So what this convergence means, so the fact that we have this convergence to delta zero, uh, 
so this means, as I said before, that the orbit of x, on average, is spending all of its time very close to zero. More and more proportion of its time. So if you look at the first one million iterations of x, and you say, OK, how many of these iterations does it spend near to x? It will be a certain probability, which will be close to 1. And the larger n is, and the greater the proportion of time out of the first n iterates is that it spends the time close to 0. Okay? So in some sense, the probability of the orbit being in a small neighborhood of 0 converges to 1 as n tends to infinity, even though the orbit itself continues to be dense. So infinitely often, you will find times in which it is far from 0, but the longer you wait and the less likely it is that if you pick an iterate at random, it will be far away from 0. The longer you wait and the more likely it is that if you pick an iterate at random, it will be very close to 0 for that particular orbit. Okay? So this is the split between the topological description of the orbit that only sees the fact that there is some subsequence that converges to any point in the interval because the orbit is dense, but does not look at the probability or the density or the distribution of the orbit with respect to time, only with respect to space. Now I can have more fun and construct even more interesting examples. Right? So suppose now I take the same point, OK? And after every sequence of zeros, I put a sequence of ones. How many ones I'll put? I'll put many more. If there's 10 zeros here, I will put, uh, well, I can do whatever I want. So let me initially put just as many ones as I have zeros, the same amount of ones as I have zeros. So here, if there's 10 zeros, I put 10 ones also. 10 zeros, 10 ones. And then, so I put 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. And then here, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And so on here, 1 million zeros followed by 1 million ones. Aha. So, what happens here? Where do I spend a lot of time? Around zero or one? That's right. Because if I look at the first, whatever, one million iterates, 99% would be either zeros or ones. About half of them will be zeros, and about half of them will be ones. So what is this converging to? Sorry? One, hour. <laughs> one half of delta zero plus delta of Dirac measure in zero plus Dirac measure in one. So there are several possibilities actually, depending on exactly how I construct. Okay? And I will not go through because this is really just a motivating example. I don't want to uh, spend too much time going through the examples. But there are several possibilities. So I can construct. Um, points, I can construct sequences which uh, 
give points x such that there's various possibilities. So I could have, for example, omega probabilistic of x equals 1 half of delta 0 plus delta 1. Or I could have, for example, omega probability of x equals delta 0 and delta 1. So today I don't want to go into the details of the sequence because it's more, it's something you can do yourself. If I do it now, you might get a bit lost. But what I want to spend a few minutes on is discussing the difference between these two situations, which is very crucial. So what is the difference between these two situations? What does this say? What does this mean about the orbit of x? And what does this mean about the orbit of x? Just intuitively, in terms of where it spends the time. What does this mean? It means that I'm converging to this measure. My averages are converging to this measure. And so the probability of choosing after many, many iterations, the prob what is the prob where is most of the orbit going to be concentrated on? in this case. If I choose a point at random, where is this point likely to be? In this case. It's very hard. Okay, so let me write down the definitions. So in this case, what does this mean? This means that 1 over n sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 of phi in fi of x converges to the integral of phi with respect to this measure, which is equal to what? Exactly. This is just 1 half of phi in 0 plus phi in 1. What does this mean? So then we'll come back and see what this means. Now, what does this mean? Here I have two measures in my probabilistic omega limit set, not one. What does it mean that I have two measures? What does this converge to? It's not convergent. Exactly, it's not convergent. So you need to take a subsequence, and this converges to phi of 0. But you take a different subsequence, and k. converges to phi of 1. What's the difference between these two situations? Sorry? What do you mean? Yeah. We can't hear. You need to add something to both of them. 
What does that mean? What's B zero? Delta zero. Delta zero, delta one. What do you mean I have to add? I mean, what I'm saying is that so, so this phi of zero is simply the integral with respect, right? This is, this is just the integral, right? This is by definition, this is equal to the integral of phi d delta zero. This is equal to the integral of phi d delta one. So what does this convergence mean? So I look, I take n very large, OK? And so the average value of this, in this case, is equal to this. And why is that? What does that mean in terms of the dynamics? So what this is measuring is the value of phi close to the orbit of x, OK? So what is the orbit of x doing for this average value of phi to be the average of the values in phi in 0 and phi in 1. It is spending a certain amount of time very close to 0 and a certain amount of time very close to 1. About half the time close to 0 and half the time close to 1. Okay? The proportion of time that is spending close to phi 0 and phi 1 for n very, very large it keeps spending about half the time close to one and half the time close to the other. It's, it's just like tossing a coin. Okay? When I toss a coin, if I toss a coin once, maybe I get heads. If I toss a coin twice, maybe I get heads again. But if I toss a coin a thousand times, I will probably get close to 50%, heads and tails. If I, if I, um, if I toss it a million times, I will probably come even closer to 50%. Okay? Heads and tails you can think of as 0 and 1. So I'm spending, the, I, have, I get a sequence of zeros and 1s, which is heads and tails, and the frequency of zeros is roughly the, half, roughly the same. There's about half of your symbols are 0, half of them are 1, and the longer you wait, and the more it tends to half and half. Okay? What is this? It's not so easy to interpret this. <laughs> so the fact that there is a subsequence converging to this means what? Means that along some subsequence of times, so if you choose a certain subsequence of nj's, so you just look at those times nj's, and for those time nj's, you take the average of this from 0 to nj. So you look at everything up to nj. And if you look at the sum, you look at all the sequences, you look at this, this orbit, Okay, and then, well, you look at this average, and it's very close to phi of zero, which means that your orbit has spent 99% of its time near zero, because this average is very, very close to phi of zero. So if you choose nj correctly, and you look at where you've been up to time nj, you spend most of your time near zero. And there's an infinite number of nj's such that you spend more and more time. But if you choose your NJs in a different way, it looks like you spent all of your time near one. So now I choose a different set of NKs. And I choose this NK, and I say, OK, from, if, you, if I take the average from that time to that time, then it looks like I spent all my time near one. So let me try to explain, to give a more geometric example of this situation. Yes? Sorry? 
this, you have what? This is just the definition of the omega probability of the probabilistic omega limit set. Yes, but I'm assuming that this is the only measure in the omega, the probabilistic omega limit set. So. You're right, you're right, you're right. As it, as it happens, it's true because the, um, because the space of probability measures is compact in the weak star topology, and therefore every sequence has a converging subsequence, and therefore they must all converge. But you're right, you're right. To be very precise, that is correct. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, so let me give a more geometric example of this phenomenon, okay, which I think is a nice example. Um, I don't really want to erase this, but... Let me give another example in which a similar thing happens. So this is an example like this, in which we have suppose we have two fixed points. So this is a map F from R2 to R2. It can also be a continuous time dynamical system of flow, but we haven't spent so much time with continuous time flows, but it can be either continuous or discrete. Suppose it's got two fixed points, and these are, you can, you can construct it so they're linear maps, hyperbolic linear maps, right? So here you have a stable eigenspace of the linear map, here you have the unstable eigenspace of the linear map, and here you have the unstable eigenspace, and here you have a stable eigenspace, okay? And then suppose you have these, all the trajectories on this unstable eigenspace, they lie on a curve, and they converge to P1. So these stable and unstable eigenspaces, they join up in this way, according to this picture. And then suppose that we have a point X here, and the orbit of this point lies on a spiral that does this and that moves around and gets closer and closer to this set. So the omega limit set of x at least in the continuous time case. So it's a little bit easier, in fact, to imagine this as a, a phase portrait of a differential equation. And then these are continuous time curves, OK? And the orbit of x is continuous time. But the, the idea is exactly the same of what happens. So the omega limit set is what? Can you see what the omega limit set would be in this case? It's the whole thing. It's the union of these two points plus these two curves that are joined in them, right? So the omega limit set is composed by P0, union P1, union, uh, these are called heteroclinic orbits, heteroclinic orbits between P0 
happy one. Now, where does this orbit spend most of the time? So, here, near this fixed point, it slows down because this is a fixed point. Right? So, when you come close to a fixed point, you don't move very fast along the fixed point. Right? If you have a flow and you have a fixed point here, and the flow looks like this, and you have an orbit that moves along like this, right? then how long does this orbit take to move from here to here? It takes a certain amount of time. And if now I take a point that is closer to the fixed point, closer to this, and it moves like this, then how long will it take to go from here to here? More or less time? It will take more time. Right? Because this is a fixed point. And so when it comes very close to the fixed point, it goes very slowly. And so it takes more time. The closer you start here, and the closer you come to the fixed point, and the more and more time it takes to move from here to here. Okay? So we use this to analyze the dynamics here. So you can take a little neighborhood of P0 here. And you can take a little neighborhood of P1 here. And then, what is the time that it takes to go from here to here? To go from the outside, from the edge of one neighborhood to the edge of the other neighborhood. This will take a certain amount of time, but it will be a fixed amount of time. It does not depend on how close you are here. There's a, this orbit takes a certain amount of time to go from here to here, and so this orbit will take some fixed finite amount of time to move from here to here. On the other hand, when it comes inside the neighborhood, it will take a certain amount of time. It will stay inside the neighborhood for a certain amount of time. Okay? And in fact, you can arrange by changing the eigenvalues here and here, you can kind of control the amount of time that it spends here. And again, I will not do all the calculations, but you can control it in such a way as to do something very interesting. So you can suppose that the time it takes here, because it goes very slowly, the time it takes here is of the order of magnitude of the whole time that it took the point to go from here all the way to here. So by the time you, if you stop here at some point n1 here, and you measure, this is x0, and you measure the amount of time that you spend inside this neighborhood compared to the full amount of time from time 0 to n minus 1, for example, half of that time is spent just in this last little bit. Okay? But then, you can also fix it in such a way that the distance at which you come out is much closer to this line than the distance when you, which you came in. So now, when you come in the next neighborhood here, you're coming in much closer to this neighborhood here. Okay? So then, you spend a lot of time in here because you go very, very, very slowly. You can spend so much time in here that the time you spend in here is 10 times as much as the time you spent in here. And so five times as much as the whole time that you spent from the beginning all the way to get to here. So if you say, OK, until this moment here, this is some time and 2 until this time here, where have I spent most of my time? And I spend, ah, I spend most of my time here because out of 100 units of time, I spend 90 units of time here and only 10 to get here. So I say, oh, I spend most of my time here, okay? But now, 
I come out even closer than I was before. So now I, I reach in some small finite number of times. I reach here. But now I'm going to pass very close to the fixed point. So close that the amount of time I spent here is 10 times bigger than all the time I spent until I got here. Until I got here. Okay? So now, at this moment here, I stop and I measure my averages and I say, well, I spent 90% or even 99% of your time, if you, if you construct in the right way, in this small neighborhood. So it looks to me like the time averages are converging to P0 because I spent 99% of the time inside P0. Okay? But then I come out. Okay, you start to see the pattern. And now I'm very close here. So because I'm very close, I just go really, really, really slowly here. Okay? So slowly that the time that I spend now to go from here to here is 99 million times more than all the time that it took me to get to here. Okay? So if I take my averages here, I say, oh, I am spending 99.9% .9 of my time in P1, near P1. So the probability of being near P0 or near P1 is oscillating. Okay? This is the crucial point. So depending on when I measure, it it looks like my averages, I have spent most of my time near P0 or most of my time near P1. Which of these two cases does this example, that this situation correspond to? Number one or number two? Number two. Right? So in these situations, the time averages are not converging because depending on where you see this subsequence and j, that is converging to phi of zero means that I take, I always wait until just after I've been inside this neighborhood. Right? And if I always wait until I come out of this neighborhood, then it will always look like most of the time 99% and then 99.9% .9 is spent inside this neighborhood. But if instead I take the subsequence of times and I wait exactly when I come out of this neighborhood, then it looks like I've spent, I'm always spending most of my time in here. And so both of these measures belong to the probabilistic omega limit set. What would this situation here correspond to in this picture? Because here also I can change things a little bit depending on the eigenvalues. So this picture was constructed by saying that the eigenvalues are designed in such a way that when you come out, you're much closer. So when you come here, you spend much, much more time, an order of magnitude of time larger here than you spent all the time before. But is it possible to construct this kind of situation where you spend half the time here and half the time here? Well, you need to to do the calculate this, but it is possible, okay, if you do it. And what does this mean exactly? What this means is that roughly the time you spend, there's not much difference. So when you come out of here, you spend a certain amount of time, and then when you come back in here, the amount of time you spend here is of the same order of magnitude as the time you spent here. It might be a little bit more, but then the next time here it's a little bit more. And here it's a little bit more, but the order of magnitude is the same. So in fact, you always the amount of time you spend here is about half of the time that you've spent in here. And then when you come back here, the time you spend here is about half the time that of all the time that has gone before, and so on. So in that case, you get a situation where it is converging, and it's converging to this linear combination of the two. So the frequency the amount, the average amount of time is converging to the fact that you're spending half your time here and half your time here. Whereas this does not mean that you're spending half the time here and half the time here. It says that depending on where you stop, it looks like you're spending all your time here, and then at other times it looks like you're spending all the time here. Okay? So it's a little bit abstract, this explanation, but I'm trying to uh, emphasize
the reason why we're interested in the fact that the probabilistic omega limit should have only one measure in this limit. Because then it means that the <coughs> statistics of the orbit are well behaved. They're not crazy. In terms of tossing a coin, this situation means that suppose I toss the coin 100 times, then maybe I see 90% heads. But if I toss it a thousand times, I see 90% tails. But if I toss it a million times, I see 90% heads. So the proportion of heads or tails that I see would depend on the scale at which you're looking at your system. Okay? This is, in some sense, the bad situation. This is what happens when the omega probabilist the probabilistic omega limit set has several measures. Okay, so all of this really is to set out the main uh, question. Okay, so. Question, when do we have, do we have an omega probabilistic flex is a single And we would like to study some properties of this measure. So IE, so we can formulate this problem as follows. So let M compact metric space. Um, let M again equals the space of Borel probability measures. So for mu in M, let B of mu equals a set of points X such that 1 over N sum I equals 0 N minus 1 phi composed with phi X converges to the integral of phi demure for phi continuous. Sorry? Borel. <laughs> So we're going to study the problem in this way. So the problem I have tried to motivate, I said you, you've given a system and you can have lots of different kinds of behavior for the statistics of the orbit. Okay? So we would like to know that generally the statistics is well behaved. So the fact that the probabilistic omega limit set contains a single measure is saying that that measure is describing in a quantitative way the dynamics of the orbit in terms of its distribution in time. 
Okay? So that is good. That is a description. That is a more sophisticated description, if you want, than the topological limit, as I've shown you. That you can have an uh, orbit that is topologically dense, but it spends most of its time near zero. Okay? So we're looking from that point of view. And from the example I gave you, I think I illustrated the fact that if the, there are two subsequences converge to different measures, that is a, not a very pleasant situation because that means that the statistics of the orbit depend on when you measure, on when you look at the orbit. Okay? So in terms of application, phenomena, in all terms, this is perhaps mathematically an interesting situation, but it's a situation that we would like to say does not happen most of the time. Okay? So to study this situation, uh, it turns out to be more convenient to fix a measure and say, okay, is, let's look at the set of points where these averages converge exactly to the right measure. Okay? So rather than just picking a point and looking at all different points and seeing what happens, let's fix a measure and see if there are any points whose time averages converge to the average with respect to that measure. This is called the basin of the measure mu. It's in some sense the basin of attraction of the measure mu. So in the example that I showed before, if you take the 2x mod 1 and mu the Dirac delta on 0, then we constructed a point. What we did before was to construct a point that had this property. So we showed that there exists at least one point that is in the basin. Okay? In general, of course, we don't know that there exists any point in this basin. But all the points in this basin, their asymptotic statistical behavior is described by the measure in this sense. So, um, so the question is, is question, is the basin non-empty? The first question, of course. So I think maybe this is a good moment to stop. And what we will do next time is we will start introducing the results and the notation to be able to address this question in quite general dynamical systems. OK, thank you. Thank you.